This is question 64 of the Summa Theologia, and it is the last question on the Treatise of the Angels. And I hope if you have been through all these videos that you have enjoyed learning from the angelic doctor. And it is so satisfying to understand what this great mind has to say about philosophy and also theology. And so this is it. You know, the Treatise of the, of the Angels uh, ends with this question. And uh, like I've said a few times, this is not the end of the angels. We're going to hear a lot more about the angels when we get into the treatise on the governance of the world in a few weeks. But uh, this is going to close out this particular treatise and on to the next one tomorrow. This has four articles, uh, not very long, should be relatively quick. And the first article says whether the demon's intellect is darkened by privation of the knowledge of all truth. Now this has to do as the title of this is the punishment of the demons. And so when the demons decided against God, remember this happened in the interval right after they were created, there was a little pause, they were able to make a decision for or against God. And then if the demons did as any demon, of course, if they're demons, that means they chose against God. And so was all of their intellect darkened? Was their intellect and all their knowledge taken away, uh, all truth that they knew? And St. Thomas says the knowledge of truth is twofold. Okay, Thomas loves twofold things, one which comes of nature and one which comes of grace. Now, this is a ongoing theme in the Summa is that the things that we can do through our nature and the things that we need super added help or grace in order to achieve. So he's making that distinction. And then he says the knowledge which comes of grace is likewise twofold. OK, so now you got three types. The first is purely speculative. And anytime you hear about speculative, that means the contemplation of truth. It doesn't have to do with operations. It has to do with the contemplation of truth, right? As when divine secrets are imparted to an individual, the other is effective and produces love for God, which knowledge properly belongs to the gift of wisdom. Okay, so it's very, very good explanation there. Of these three kinds of knowledge, the first was neither taken away nor lessened in the demons. For it follows from the very nature of the angel, who according to his nature is an intellect or mind, since on account of the simplicity of his substance, nothing can be withdrawn from his nature so as to punish him by subtracting from his natural powers. Okay, so Thomas is saying here that God is going to respect the nature that he gave to a particular creature. He's, he's not going to take away something that is natural to him. And Thomas says, as a man is punished by being deprived of a hand or a foot or something else. OK, uh, if we have a, a hand or a foot removed, well, that's part of our nature, right? To be able to to, to move our to, to hold on to things and to, to walk with a foot. And then he says the second kind of knowledge, however, which comes of grace and consists in speculation has not utterly been taken away from them, but lessened. Because of these divine secrets, only so much is revealed to them as is necessary. And that is done either by means of the angels or through some temporal workings of divine power, as Augustine said. But not in the same degree as the holy angels to whom many more things are revealed and more fully in the word himself. So it sounds like one of the punishments, the disciplines of the fall of the angels is that they're not given as much knowledge as maybe they otherwise would have had had they chosen for God. But then he says of the third kind of knowledge as likewise of charity, they are utterly deprived. OK, so the grace which we are given, which for us is a quality of our soul, which allows us to respond with charity to God, that is taken away. That's kind of like mortal sin for us, right? Where we cut ourselves off from charity and we are no longer in a state of grace because we've put an obstacle between God and ourselves with regard to charity. Article number two says whether the will of the demons is obstinate in evil. So what he's asking here is can the demon repent? Can the demon say, oh my goodness, I messed up. I'm so sorry. Uh, I want another chance. Okay, St. Thomas is going to say, no. Now that seems 
odd. You know, why would God not give a creature a second chance to turn to him? Well, it's because it's not in their nature to do so. Okay, It's in our nature to do so. It's in the nature of the irrational creatures to never really turn to God in that way in the first place, right? Every nature is different. He says, It was Origen's opinion that every will of the creature can, by reason of free will, be inclined to good and evil, with the exception of the soul of Christ on account of the union of the word. So Origen taught that any creature can turn back to God. Okay, once he's, he's turned away from God, he can turn back to God. Such a statement deprives angels and saints of true beatitude because everlasting stability is of the very nature of true beatitude, hence it is termed life everlasting. So with both us and the angels, once we attain beatitude, once we are united to God, we can't turn away from him, even with free will, because we are intimately connected to the good, goodness itself, <clears throat> and there'd be absolutely no motivation to turn away from union with goodness itself. Consequently, such an opinion must be considered erroneous, while according to Catholic faith, it must be held firmly, both that the will of the, of the good angels is confirmed in good, and the will of the demons is obstinate in evil. All right, we must seek for the cause of this obstinacy, not in the gravity of the sin, but in the condition of the nature or state. Okay, so as I mentioned a moment ago, this has to do with the very nature of the angels. Well, how, what does that mean? He's going to explain. Now, it is clear that all the mortal sins of men, grave or less grave, are pardonable, pardonable before death, whereas after death they are without remission and endure forever. So once death occurs, like with us, once we die, we are judged. And that's irrevocable. Okay, We can't turn back. While we're here on earth, we can sin even mortally, confess, pick ourselves back up. It's a great blessing of our nature that we're able to do this. We should take advantage of that. And then he says, to find the cause then of this obstinacy, it must be borne in mind that the appetitive power in all things is proportioned to the apprehensive whereby it is moved. Okay, this has to do with the will and the intellect with us as the movable by its mover. All right, so this is great philosophy here. For the sensitive appetite seeks a particular good while the will seeks the universal good. So a creature like a dog only has a sensitive appetite, so it seeks particular goods, a bone or a food or a, a treat, right? Uh, but what he's going to say is the angel only can pursue universal good. Now, we are in between because we have sensitive appetites and we have wills. We are complicated in that sort, in that sense. Okay, also the sense apprehends particular objects while the intellect considers universals. Oh, universals is such an important word in philosophy. Have you heard of nominalism? Have you heard of William of Ockham? The problem of universals is so big, so significant. At some point, I'll go into more explanation about this, but I don't think this is the time. Now, the angel's apprehension differs from man in this respect, that the angel, by his intellect, apprehends immovably, as we apprehend immovably first principles, which are the object of the habit of intelligence, whereas man, by his reason, apprehends movably, passing from one consideration to another and having the way open by which he may proceed to either of two opposites. All right, so this is the difference between discursive, rational creatures like us and intellectual creatures like the angels, where they don't, as we've already explained, go from one thing to the next, but they just know. Okay, the knowledge is infused. Consequently, man's will adheres to a thing movably and with the power of forsaking it and clinging to the opposite. Okay, because of our nature, we can kind of shift back and forth. We can be attracted to something movably, and then we, we go away from it, and then we go towards it, right? Whereas the angels, where adhere at the, the, angels, the angels' will adheres fixably and immovably. Therefore, of his will, if it be considered before its adhesion, 
it can freely adhere either to this or to its opposite, namely in such things as it does not will naturally. But after he has once adhered, he clings immovably. So it is customary to say that man's free will is flexible to the opposite both before and after choice, but the angel's free will is flexible either opposite before the choice, but not after. Okay, this has to do with a different nature in the angels where their intellect is not movable. Okay, they have a chance to make a choice. They have a contingency. They have, you know, this is their choice. Once they make it, they're locked in. Whereas we, having a different nature, can change back and forth until the moment that we die. Article three, whether there is sorrow in the demons. Fear, sorrow, joy, and the like, so far as they are passions, cannot exist in the demons, for thus they are proper to the sensitive appetite, which is a power of a corporeal organ. All right, remember, angels are incorporeal creatures. They don't have bodies, they don't have passions, and they, they don't have, uh, well, sensitive appetites either, right? According, however, as they denote simple acts of the will, they can be in the demons. And it must be said that there is sorrow in them because sorrow as denoting a simple act of the will is nothing else than the resistance of the will to what is or what is not. Now it is evident that the demons would wish many things not to be which are and others to be which are not. For out of envy, they would wish others to be damned who are saved. Consequently, sorrow must be said to exist in them and especially because it is of the very notion of punishment for it to be repugnant to the will. Moreover, they are deprived of happiness, which they desire naturally, and their wicked will is curbed in many respects. All right, so when we talk about sorrow within us, our sorrow is a passion. I guess it could be related to the will in that regard, but generally speaking, sorrow is going to be one of the uh, concupiscible passions. Okay, so... Article 4, whether our atmosphere is the demon's place of punishment. So when the demons are punished, are they punished here around us? I show this picture here of these two people riding a bike. But we know that there is some kind of demonic element going on in the world. We probably feel it. You probably feel tempted. And we know from exorcism that demons are interacting in the world here below. But we also learned that there are demons in hell. So are they in the hell or are they here? That's what St. Thomas Aquinas is going to uh, talk about here. Okay, I'm going to read these two paragraphs real quickly. The angels in their own nature stand midway between God and men. Now the order of divine providence so disposes that it procures the welfare of the inferior orders through the superior. Okay, there's a hierarchy. But man's welfare is disposed by divine providence in two ways. First of all, directly, when a man is brought unto good and withheld from evil. And this is fittingly done by the good angels. In another way, indirectly, is when anyone assailed is exercised by fighting against opposition. It was fitting for this procuring of man's welfare to be brought about through the wicked spirits lest they should cease to be of service in the natural order. Consequently, a twofold place of punishment is due to the demons. One, by reason of their sin, and this is hell, and another, in order that they may tempt men, and thus the darksome atmosphere is their due place of punishment. So, some are in hell, some are down here, you know, terrorizing us. The last paragraph here now the procuring of men's salvation is prolonged even to the judgment day. Consequently, the ministry of the angels in wrestling with demons endures until then. Hence, until the good angels are sent to us here and the demons in this dark atmosphere for our trial, although some of them are even now in hell to torment those whom they have led astray, just as some of the good angels are with the holy souls in heaven. But after the judgment day, all the wicked, both men and angels, will be in hell, and all the good will be in heaven. And so until the final judgment, until Jesus comes again, and we have the final, the final judgment, there are going to be some of the demons here, you know, tempting man, trying to lead us astray, and there's going to be some 
tormenting the souls in hell. After judgment, everybody goes to heaven and everybody or everybody goes to hell. All right, that is going to put an end to the treatise on the angels. I hope you enjoyed these, what, 15 questions. They, they go by so fast, don't they? We are going to begin tomorrow the a whole new treatise on the creation of the world. And so, you know, get ready, put your thinking cap on. It's going to be a lot of fun ta talking about St. Thomas's teaching on how God created the world in seven days and all the particulars of that. All right. Thank you for joining in through the Summa. One question at a time. God bless you. St. Thomas Aquinas, pray for us.